Good afternoon. Otto, thank you for joining me today. Um, as we just heard, Stegra has been um, really a lighthouse company in terms of climate tech fundraising. Um, over an incredibly, well, relatively short period of time, three and a half years, you've raised a massive amount of capital for a hugely ambitious project from multiple different um, funding sources. And all of that in a time when interest rates had massive fluctuation, massive inflation, big changes in market appetite for climate tech investing. Um, so outside in, it looks easy, um, but I know it hasn't always been. Uh, and you're going to have some fantastic lessons to share with the, um, with the audience here today. Uh, so maybe just for those who don't know Stegra so well and maybe even know it by its old name, H2 Green Steel, can you just talk a little bit about the genesis of Stegra? What's the ambition? How was it founded? Yeah, thank you for, uh, for arranging this uh, opportunity for us to, to, to be heard also at Slush. Um, we started in 2020, uh, towards the end of 2020, really with a, with a vision to, to address um, the steel industry and emissions in the steel industry. It's one of the, 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 it is the largest industrial emitter in the world, and in total is close to 10% of global CO2 emissions. Um, the Genesis was more or less a challenge from Volkswagen to help them uh, address uh, steel emissions in the car production. So as you see automotive manufacturers shift from internal combustion engine cars towards, towards uh, battery electric vehicles, the emissions that are related to a car uh, change from tailpipe emissions during the use of the car, um, being sort of 90% of the emissions, to the emissions during the production of a car. And when you look at a um, battery electric vehicles, steel emissions are approximately a third of total emissions. Um, our steel will reduce those emissions by approximately 95%. So we will, we will go from 2.2, 2.3 tons of CO2 emitted in producing a ton of steel to close to 0 0.1. Um, and we are doing that by using green hydrogen instead of coal in the manufacturing process. The Whenever you look at the steel industry or you look at basic material industries, you realize that it is extremely capital intense. Um, and in order to get economy, economy uh, or, or low enough cash cost to be competitive with a, with a green product in a brown market, you really have to build at scale. Um, and so the plant we are building is a 5 million ton steel plant in the north of Sweden. Um, and we will be able to take out 10 million tons of CO2 a year uh, equivalent uh, when we are uh, fully constructed. And that's equivalent, just to give a sense of, you know, a, a quarter of Sweden, Sweden's total CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. Impressive. Impressive and, uh, and ambitious. Um, and I think you were one of the very first hires into the company. So the company was built with a CFO mindset um, from the beginning. And I know we've talked about how important it was to make sure that the company was financeable, that the plan you were putting together was financeable. Tell us a little bit about that. What were the things you had to consider? Yeah, the truth is it, it's not zero to eight billion dollars, it's three thousand dollars, which was the first thing we, we, I, I put in a bank account for us to be able to, uh, to set up and to be able to sign uh, employment agreements for, for for the first group of uh, group of people, and um, I think what what was clear to us already from the beginning is is exactly that it will be extremely capital intense, um, and we are setting up to to we're we're starting a business that really needs to raise eight billion dollars in this case in four years, and if we were if we raise six billion dollars or five billion dollars, it would simply not be sufficient uh, to build a plant, and and so. And I, and, I, and I think this is a really important, regardless of the amount of capital that you need to, to, to pursue whatever uh, vision it is that you have, you have to build a company that is not only catering to customers, but also catering to investors, to the extent that you need external capital. 
Um, and that just means you need a financeable business at its core. And so we started really from in every dimension of how we built the business, we thought about investments. Um, and, and we have different stakeholders. We don't only have um, equity investment and we don't only have venture capital investors. We really had to cater to senior lenders, so banks, uh, mezzanine lenders, second lien lenders. We have a small amount of public funding support as well. We have traditional equity from, from some very large institutions. And we have some infrastructure investors. Um, and so to put this entire sort of piece together, um, which we knew it had to be cut in these different ways, meant we had to address the, uh, the core of the business uh, with the lens of it being financeable. And I think the most, maybe the, um, the clearest example of that is on the customer side. So it was evident to us um, that what we were going to produce, to produce a green steel product, is more expensive than to produce a brown steel product. Um, we can, with the way that we are designed, we can get to a lower cash cost to produce that product. But we are investing, obviously, a significant amount of capital to build the plant, which means um, we needed to have a premium to get the returns required, both to get the cash generation required to, to be able to attract sufficient amount of debt capital, but we also needed um, a premium to be able to attract um, equity investors uh, to the project. And so the first point uh, of action was to build the market for green steel. Mm -hmm. And I think what today... Um, appears more obvious at least, not obvious maybe, but more obvious, is the willingness of a customer to pay a premium for a sustainable product. When we started out four years ago and, and um, called up, I mean, just to give you an, an anecdote, just trying to call BMW um, and telling them, you know, we have, here's a contract, it's for seven years, uh, it's a hard take-or-pay contract, which means you have to take the product and pay for the product. You have no outs from this contract as long as we are delivering the product to you. Um, and you're going to pay a premium. And we don't have a steel plant. You know, this combination for a German steel buyer whose entire career is about really pushing costs, pushing down, fighting uh, with you know, signing uh, quarterly commitments or yearly commitments. And here they are signing commitments in 2021, which is going to stretch all the way out until 2033. And they're going to, and this guy is telling me I'm going to pay a premium. So it's a complete mind shift in the, uh, uh, for the customer. And, and you have so many stakeholders among the customers. You have the procurement department that, generally speaking, don't want to pay a premium. You have a strategy on the customer side, on a C-level, that may, may want to pay a premium. Um, and you need to align all of these different parts within a, com within a, uh, a competitor, <coughs> uh, or sorry, within a customer to, to unlock a green premium for the product. And this is something we had to build throughout our entire customer portfolio of um, half of our steady state volumes, so 15, 20 billion dollars of contracts that have been signed. Um, and that was absolutely essential to unlock the financing for the project. And this is completely unique. You know, it, it is the, the exact same product at its core, uh, 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 a steel coil product. Looks the same, works the same, feels the same, but the customer pays, in our case, a 25% premium because of the way that it's produced. And that has become critical. And, and, and so the, kind of the long way to say that I think this is one example, customer contracts, then you have supplier contracts, you have equipment contracts, you have, in our case, construction contracts, electricity, you have employees, you have what competence you're bringing and how you organize yourself. All of these things, I think, if we didn't have a, a, a lens of this needs to be financeable and, and, and we need to cater to senior lender risk and we also need to cater to the equity investors' return requirements, if we did not approach every aspect of our business from the genesis or from the start, um, it would not be possible to finance this project. And let me ask you, because I'm sure there's lots of people here who are seeing what we've seen in many climate tech businesses, that 
people talk a good game about wanting green products, but they rarely are prepared to pay more for it. Um, so what was it that enabled you to charge a green premium? Yeah, I mean, it was far from... Uh, it was far, it, I think the first thing to say, it is extremely difficult. Extremely difficult, and, uh, and you need to be super persistent, but that's like in the nature of any startup. You need to be extremely resi resilient, you need to believe in your vision, and you need to sell that vision. And, 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 and a, so, so that's the same as everywhere else. What was critical for us in the sales process and how we engaged with customers was really around education. There was an enormous amount of misinformation in the market. Um, there's a lot of greenwashing in the market. Mm -hmm. And you need to cut through um, with your message. Obviously, the, the foundation needs to be that your product is actually sustainable. When you take everything into account and you look at every aspect of it, is your product, and if you scale your product significantly, you know, if we were to build 10 plants, or you know, to really think about it in, in, in this context, is this good for the, climate or for the planet or not? Is this helping the climate or not? And, and, and that's the starting point. And then once you're there, you just need to translate that vision to the customer. And I think where, where steel became very, very impactful is the fact that it is the same. So let's say just for the argument's sake that we charge a $300 per ton of steel premium and we take out two tons of steel. This means we charge the customer $150 per ton of CO2 that they take out of their supply chain. With steel, this is a fully, fully loaded cost since the product is the same. If you buy a, 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 a which, which is why I think steel is sort of first out from the hard to abate industries in achieving this and can, can kind of lead the way a little bit. If you're buying textiles or, or, or rubbers or plastics, you may have other challenges around retooling costs or you may have a different feeling for the customer in terms of quality or, or, or you need, might need to redesign something in your product. This is, a, uh, I think, unique with steel. So for them, it's an easy implementation. Mm -hmm. Um, really educating them that this is what um, you're getting and it is truly, truly sustainable and unique. The fact that we are reducing 95%, I think, was critical to achieving a green premium and to get their attention. I think if we were to go to them and say, hey, we have this product, it's 50% decarbonized and we can take out 50%, it would not feel like the product of the future it would not feel like a revolution of the steel industry, it would feel like an evolution. And I think that we would have never gotten the attention that was required from, you could talk to the procurement department and the sustainability department will generally you know, entertain you and depending on those conversations and depending on the customer, they may or may not have the mandate or sufficient amount of mandate to really uh, also sign something with you or drive something with you. Um, but when, um, uh, when, when it is you know, a billion dollar contract, you need C-level attention and you need CEO attention and, and most of them go to the board uh, to get this signed. And so there you need to have this really, really crisp case, really revolutionary case and, and, and cut deep into their emissions. And, and look, you have to solve their problem for them. I mean, the, they have most of the companies um, in Europe have science-based targets. They are trying to achieve reductions of, you know, most of them have 30% is a common uh, target, 30% reduction target between today and the end of 2030. How can you and your product be helpful in that without at the same time being disrupted to their operations? And this, I think, is what we offer. Yeah. And one of the things you, you talked about just now that I think um, is probably interesting to a lot of people here is <clears throat> about the fact that one type of financing or a customer contract is what unlocks the next piece of financing. And you have so many interdependencies between the customer contracts, the equity investment, the debt, um, grant funding, et cetera. So you're trying to shepherd a load of different sources of financing together. How did you navigate that? Because I think every, pretty much every climate business that we see is, is navigating exactly that oh. same set of challenges and that same group of financing sources they need to bring together. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a pain in the ass, to be, <laughs> to be honest with you. I think 
you have um, everyone is looking at everyone. So the way that this financing is put together is not increments, small increments. We did a initial seed round or A round, which was uh, $100 million. Then we did a second round, which was uh, $280 million, uh, $280, $300 million. And then we went to $8 billion. So there was no in-between, <laughs> you know. Nobody was going to put a billion dollars into a company and say, yeah, build 5% uh, of a steel mill. We knew the steel mill was going to cost, to, to put everything together, you know, it's going to cost this much. And so we had to get all of the capital at once. So you had to, and when you have, the lenders will come in and they will say, well, where is the equity? The equity will come in and say, where, is the, 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 where are the lenders? And so you had to run parallel processes um, where, in our case, we had you know, term sheets, we had commitment letters, we had signing with a lot of conditions, and then we had closing. Uh, and, and so when you're trying to do a, 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 a debt, when you're looking at really hard assets that you're financing and you're using either a project finance structure or, or any type of lending structure at the same time, I think it's, it's really helpful to divide it up into term sheets, commitment letters, and, and then um, commitment letters is an important stage, and then signing. And, and you, you can sign with a, with a set of conditions precedent, so conditions to basically receiving the funding later. And I, and I think creating this dynamic um, was absolutely essential to get everyone across the line. We drove our process, I would say, with the lenders. Uh, we worked with the lenders to create, the, which was a prerequisite for anything. Um, and then equity was able to piggyback off of the lender process and the lender requirements, which are excruciating. I mean, the le lender process, in our case, to borrow, you know, four and a half billion dollars when you have no existing business and when you are a startup, I mean, uh, I don't know if anyone here <laughs> tried to borrow money, uh, as a startup, it's not an easy, it's not an easy thing. I mean, I think our our data room has a table of contents that's 470 pages long. So, to give you a sense of the amount of material that is in there and the amount of the diligence work that has been done, and and at the end of the day, it shouldn't be easy to to raise eight billion dollars. So I'm, I'm I'm not to. I I don't think it should be necessarily very different, but I, but I, but I think you should. Because we started the company with this mindset, knowing that we would go through these processes, we were prepared, I would say, uh, to enter into it. And then the requirements came. We involved the banks very, very early on. Um, and I think equity is easier to predict their requirements, what they are looking for, what they want. And there are, I would say, many different <laughs> equity investors that have different appetites for different things. And so you might have to meet 100 of them or 200 of them to find you know, your, uh, your partner. Um, and that's just uh, the nature of it. And that we went through the same thing on our, on our equity process. On the lender side, it's different. Um, the, the, they all come together much more. They have a much more known set of requirements. Their returns are capped. And so their focus is, you know, what's the right return requirement for this amount of risk that I'm absorbing? Um, and that's where I think you can have a much more predictable uh, um, process. And then you can really, once you've brought in and you've catered to their risk uh, level or risk appetite, and you've been able to structure your business, really, and not structure your transaction, that's an element of it, but really structure your business around these senior lender requirements, that will translate to equity investors, the even equity investors that come in early and, and, and look at something like this. But I guess that's actually one of the, com the complexities of this is, uh, as you're just saying, that you've got people who've got different upsides and different downsides. Yep. So you've got stakeholders with different views on how you should balance risk versus ambition. Um, how did you think about that at the beginning and how has that thinking evolved as the, the companies progressed, the markets have changed? Yep. I think we, I mean, 
for this was a critical point for us to get it together. Like you've said before, and it's the amount of capital is so enormous, and it's it's a do or die structure. Either you get it, like I said, either you get it, or you, there's no point in trying to build a steel plant with half the money. <laughs> so um, I think where we had to look at that, and again, it comes back to the business to an extent. You look at this capital requirement. And then you have to look at how can you create, you know, let's say, use easy numbers, senior lender risk, 5% return, mezzanine lender or second lien lender, 10% return, equity investors, depends on the equity investor what they believe. I believe it costs 30% plus. I think our investors probably think it costs anywhere around 20 to 25%. Okay. And some might want, to, want it to cost 15% because they come more from an infra world in our case. So, how do you create, both from how the business is structured, how you, in our case, execute construction and, and, and you, you execute ramp up of the plant, and, 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 but how you create financial structures where you can have, where, where you can create 5% risk up to a certain level, where you can create 10% risk in an inter, intermediate layer, and how you can then, uh, which kind of le leaves a, a sufficiently geared equity and sufficiently attractive equity returns as a consequence of the, of the leverage that you have uh, and the small slice of, of, of public funding. We also have some off-balance sheet funding, which was also structured to, to be catered more towards an infrastructure investor. But I think this was really the... I mean, this was absolutely essential to be able to do this. And I think when you are building large-scale plants, I, I really recommend as a, I really recommend this approach. You have to, it, it doesn't mean you need to have the same structure of us with first lien, second lien, equity, off balance sheet, on balance sheet, whatever. It doesn't necessarily have to be that structure, but you have to ta tap multiple sources of funding. You, you cannot get to these amounts of, uh, these volumes if you only cater to an equity universe and, and, and they would never accept, this was all equity funded, they would never accept those returns. And equally, the lenders will obviously only lend you so much and so on. So I think slice, the, slice it up and, and, and think about how to structure those uh, pockets. Yeah. And then go after that investor universe. I mean, and they are all equally difficult. <laughs> like, you have to meet 100 equity investors to find one. You have to meet 100, uh, you know, second lead investors to fi fi find one and so on. And that's just uh, life, I guess. And your role has been so critical. I mean, you've really led this, um, the, all of these aspects of, of financing. Um, I'm sure plenty of people are thinking, wow, I need, I need a good CFO, whether that's a founder or an investor. Like that role is so critical for a climate company that's got this level of ambition. Um, what, are the, what, what would you say were the skills that you brought that helped you to be so successful in, in, these, in, in putting these groups of funding together and what should someone look for in a CFO? I think... If I were to give anyone, a, give anyone advice, I think don't underestimate having a, 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 a at least semi-charismatic CFO. I, I think there's this a little bit the view that we're supposed to sit in a basement with a pen and paper and a calculator, but I, but I think, you're, I think you, you need to be able to credibly put together a business. You, you need to put together a business then uh, you can put that into an Excel and a PowerPoint and whatever, but that's all secondary, mm. <laughs> you know, that's all storytelling. But at the heart, there needs to be a viable business. And, and I think where, again, it, what's been critical for us was to have that approach from the start. So create the business, have constantly have in mind the different pockets of capital that you are going to tap, uh, and my background is split across credit and, and equity. So for me, that, that was natural to, to be able to cater to both of those groups. Um, but to, 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 to build the business, to in, help inform the business on how we need to contract and, and, you know, with customers or equity, with suppliers or whatever it may be, um, so that the business case that came out was something that became financeable. Um, and then it is, you know, I, I, I don't think uh, it's, it, you know, you know the, the, there are so many technical questions 
from investors and lenders and so on, that you need a CFO that can both be charismatic, you need to get so many people together and want. I think in climate, if you want climate investments, you need your investors and stakeholders to want mm -hmm. you to succeed. Yeah. And that requires you to be somewhat likable, at least. <laughs> Yep. Thank you, Otto. I think we're out of time. I'm sure there's many more topics we could talk about, um, but hopefully that's given some valuable learnings to our audience today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks.